Good morning, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate this opportunity to get together and to find out a little bit more about bees. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, the Bee Biogeography and Systematics Talks. Um, today, or sorry, I guess I should introduce myself first. My name is Carolyn Davies, and I'm going to be working here behind the scenes. Um, we're going to be um, having a presentation today with Dr. Michael Orr. Um, after the presentation, we will be having a Q&A period. Uh, we please ask that your questions um, are put within the Q&A feature, which can be accessed at the bottom of your screen. This will make sure that your questions uh, don't get lost sort of amongst all the different chat entries. Um, we understand that not everyone can stay past the hour mark for uh, the extended Q&A and discussion period, uh, but we will be recording this presentation. So if you need to leave at the top of the hour or cannot stay for that uh, discussion period, uh, you will be able to access the recording on the YouTube channel for the Center for Bee Ecology, Evolution and Conservation upon publication of the research. Before I begin, um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the territory of the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee and Ojibwe nations. York University also recognizes that many indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat and the Métis. It is now home to many indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Since we're all coming together virtually from 32 countries actually across the globe, I'd like to encourage you to learn more about um, and consider the history of the land that you are on today. A uh, fabulous resource for this exploration is www.native-land.ca. Uh, and now I'd like to welcome Dr. Lawrence Packer, Distinguished Research Professor at York University. Uh, where's the video gone? Okay, there. Uh, oh, so it tells me the host has stopped my video. Well, I don't really mind. You know, I'm nowhere near as pleasant to look at as any of the other people on this, on this call, but oh, there I am. So, um, yes, welcome, world. Uh, 32 different countries. That's fantastic. Um, the format of today's presentation will be a slightly different from earlier ones because I have COVID-19 and I am not mentally alert enough to deal with the rigors of dealing with the questions and answers at the end. And so Silas Bossett has volunteered to do that. And he better damn well be here. That's all I can say. Okay, so um, it gives me great pleasure today to introduce Michael Orr. Um, this is the introduction that he sent us. Michael Orr is currently an assistant professor at the Institute of Zoology, Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. He began working with bees with Dr. Diane, Brian Danforth during his undergraduate then working with Dr. Sean Brady and Sam Drogi before then completing his PhD with Terry Griswold at Utah State on various aspects of bee biology with a focus on the apid subfamily Anthophorini. Thereafter, in his words, he actually asked me to say this as well as that disclaimer, he ran away to China to plot global bee domination at a remote field station in the Hengduan Mountains. Now that sounds just fabulous. He didn't say that, I just, I just added that. Today, he'll tell us about the various work he has done on the biology of Anthophorini, spanning both natural history through systematics. And with no further ado, welcome Michael Orr. Hey, thanks everyone. Um, especially thanks Lawrence and Carolyn for actually organizing the seminar series. They've been great so far. And um, I'm really glad to present to you all today, talking about some of the work that I've done through, I don't know, maybe almost, maybe over 10 years now. It, it's been quite a long time, but it's been a fun ride. So 
Hopefully you'll find it enjoyable as well. I'm going to put my put my talk up now. And I think everyone should be able to see my slides now. Yes, it looks great, Michael. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So um, basically today I'm going to talk about things from natural history, et cetera, onward, uh, quite a broad variety of topics. Um, but first I should acknowledge that, especially for the uh, phylogenomics work here, um, I was working very closely with another Michael, Michael Brandstetter. Uh, he was instrumental in a lot of that project. So I'd be remiss not to mention that at the start. And let's go right into it now. So the family Apidae, this is the largest bee family. Um, it's got about 6,000 species, one third ish, just a bit under for the 20,000 or so total bee species. There's a huge range of social, uh, parasitic, floral specialization, various nesting behaviors. There's all kinds of things that you can study in this group, but most research has certainly been on the eusocial species. They're less than a seventh of the total. And here you can see some of them that I've encountered well over in China and Asia in general. Um, there though, I've still kept up my focus on these Anthophernae. This is now a subfamily. It was recently raised by Silas. Um, you can see here some of the variety of body forms. And actually there's quite a bit more variety than this. These are just the ones that I've taken myself that I think look pretty enough to put on a slide. But these are not just pretty faces though. They're a very good model group because of all those behaviors um, that they show, because of all the forms and functions, specialization, et cetera. They're also distributed worldwide. This is very beneficial. So you can see how they live in various different environments. And they're relatively representative because of that, of the overall patterns of bee biodiversity, unlike the eusocial species, which in general, you'll actually see more of them near the equator, unlike bees overall which we uh, demonstrated among quite a few other things in a recent paper on global bee distribution. Um, floral specialization, I haven't actually published too much on this topic yet, but I've still looked a lot into it, especially with the Micranthophora, the subgenus that I worked on most for my PhD. Um, and that's because they're actually pretty much all to some degree specialists, although to vary it, varying degrees. Some of these like Anthophora curta in the red and Anthophora petrophila in the yellow here, they're very widespread, they're very common. These are pretty generalist, although they definitely still seem to prefer Asteraceae as many species in the group do. Um, and some on the other hand, they're actually using few or maybe even one species. You can see on one side here is Anthophora hololuca, um, then several sorrel thamnus plants that it's specialized on. That's basically the only thing you'll find it on is sorrel thamnus, but it does seem to use multiple species. Um, if it used only one species, it actually would not be able to have that large of a range that's shown here because it overlaps the range of multiple species that have mutually exclusive ranges. Um, then conversely, there's Anthophora mortuaria. This is a relatively uncommon species. I've only actually collected it once and lo and behold, that one time it was on the edge of an agricultural field in Plutia sericea. So it seems very closely linked to its host as many specialists are. But I think really the one that takes the cake for all of the uh, Anthophora and their kin that I've worked on, it would probably be this Abronia villosa or Ab Anthophora abronii, which visits Abronia villosa. Um, I've found males patrolling even around just a single plant at a dune site. Um, I'd looked for more plants, but I couldn't find them. Um, every single time I've found this, I've found the plant. I can't say the same in the reverse because sometimes it's been bad weather and maybe they're not out flying but they are incredibly well adapted. They've got this very long galea. Um, they just kind of dunk it down into the flower, pull it out, and then it's covered in pollen. 
these very narrow corollas, they're hard to reach, so very few other bees will actually visit them. This group is often pollinated by um, things like hawk moths or other various moths. But you can see here, if I can make the video work, that actually they're incredibly efficient with their visits. So just bam, 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 that flower's done. They go on to the next one. They've got pollen. They can clean it in between, which they often do. And whenever they don't, or if they're a bit messy about it, then they're actually bringing the pollen over to the next flower and of course, pollinating as a result. And then on the other extreme of this, we've got things like super generalists. Um, this is Anthophora urbana from a different subgenus, the Mystacanthophora. And this thing is found basically everywhere in the West. Um, these are two different Maxent models uh, made a, quite a while ago by Harold Dykerd. Um, and you can see these are huge ranges. One of them is the red, a solid red, and the other is high suitability in white. So it shows this uh, less conservative model. It's basically able to live almost everywhere except the tops of mountains and extremely wet areas. Um, it's visited recording um, over 70 plant families, hundreds and hundreds of genera. Um, it goes from the bottom of almost the bottom of Death Valley to the top of the mountains there, Telescope Peak, that's over, I think, 11,000 feet maybe. It's a very impressive species. So there's quite this variety of different species that are actually there to study in this group. And one of the ways in which I've studied them beyond the floral biology, which is mostly unpublished, is nesting biology. So nesting biology, these are all ground nesters of some type, although some of them do reuse nests like a cavity nester would. Those species uh, so far are ones that are also excavating at some point. Um, Anthophora Pueblo is a great, very interesting example. Um, they prefer sandstone, actually, we found, but only when it's weak enough. If it's too hard, they're just totally avoiding it. They'll actually use something like silt, which you can see in the upper left of the map image there. Um, and they're likely doing this for durability, but it seems like it can also prevent or reduce pathogens and parasites as well. So there's a lot that's been done with this species already, but as soon as I get a chance to actually revisit the sites and do more, I think there's still a lot that can be done. Um, and this is actually a site from uh, Frank Parker's day. He actually, 40 years or so ago, he discovered this. He brought them back to the lab and reared them out. And then they actually came out for several years thereafter. So it shows that if they're actually nesting in that substrate for so long. Um, oh, that's a dog, unfortunately. So I'm gonna let him into the room so he doesn't start barking. Sorry about that. But um, so basically they came out for multiple years thereafter. Um, and this just shows how faced with things like say the, um, maybe I can still close it though. Faced with things like, say, flash floods, it's very beneficial to actually be in such a strong substrate. And here you can see, again, the map, but focusing on another site. This is Made at Verde National Park in Colorado. And actually, this was discovered by Jim Kane a while ago and contributed very kindly to the study. These cliff dwelling nests, actually, they were inside the mortar of the cliff dwellings. So this is where, why I actually decided to name it Anthophora Pueblo. And since then, many new sites have been discovered. There's a lot going on still for this species. Um, there's various things that I want to do with it still. Um, with all these nest sites, when I can revisit them, I'm going to see what's going on, how many are still active, et cetera. Uh, you can see here, there's actually a preliminary Maxent model and that's in the gray. 
Note that it actually is extending beyond some of these sandstone areas. And I think that's going to be interesting to publish on that, talking about really how we need to take into account better a lot of these very specialized habits. How, for instance, really they wouldn't be so likely to go outside of these areas where there's basically no sandstone. Um, during these more recent studies, we've also confirmed a second excavator. This is Anthophora peritomi here. You may be able to hear the, the slight buzzing noise. There's not too much there. Um, there's also a third possible, the Anthophora escalante actually, um, but this one is very rare. Um, I've seen it flying away from sandstone high up. I've seen them patrolling sandstone but I haven't personally confirmed them excavating or nesting within it. Although there were some old nests in their vicinity when I saw these behaviors. Um, there's also a lot more been done on finding various associates at this same site, actually the exact same time, this lizard was very funnily and haplessly trying to, trying to capture and eat these bees. Um, over the time of several hours, I did not see any successes, so I'm not sure why it kept trying. It was a little bit futile from the look of it, but definitely I think there are probably these pressures that we overlook, these predation predator pressures at these aggregations. So it's something important to consider if we're really building a full ecological framework to better understand them. Um, and here, it's a bit of a bad image. This is actually because it was taken at, I think it was 7 or 8 p.m. But if you look closely, actually, you'll notice that the aggregation is covered in ants. So this is a Pogonium myrmex. These are the harvester ants, which are known mostly for harvesting things like seeds, etc. There are still records of them predating upon various things, but this was at least to my knowledge, the first one of them predating on bees at a sandstone aggregation. You can see here, one of them actually carried it out and over the span of maybe 10 or 15 minutes carrying that larva out, um, they brought it eventually back into the nest. So they're definitely potentially some type of antagonist, um, but at the same time, there may be some benefit to the bees for this because the vast majority of these ants were actually collecting things like leftover pollen or fungal buildup. So they may actually be cleaning to some degree, incidentally, these nests, which is pretty interesting. So it's very hard to figure out in a case like this, what the real net benefit is, because on one hand, you've got a lot of potential, um, a lot of potential pathogens taken out with the fungus and the pollen that it could grow on. But at the same time, every once in a while, these larvae might be taken. And at this point, we actually know over 20 different nest associates for this system. And you can see a handful of pictures of them here. This is a wide array of things. Many of them are actually secondarily cavity nesting in the system. Um, especially when the bees have abandoned the sites, which does not seem very uncommon from my observations. Actually, most of the sites I've found do seem to be abandoned um, and then taken over secondarily by things like Ashmediella, Megachile, Osmia, etc. cetera. Um, but you may also notice that quite a few of these, these are actually antagonists of some Form. These are villains that are going after the bees or going after these other bees that have taken over later. It's still at this time a little bit hard to discern sometimes what they've actually been going after, um, depending on the type of nest or which of the things that comes later they're actually going after. But so there's still quite a few various types of parasites involved in this system and antagonists. Um, you may recall that I said maybe it helps avoid them. That's specifically because it may reduce their numbers. It seems like it's based on uh, trichrania, and this is published in the first paper, 
Um, based on trichrania numbers year over year, it looks like actually they, they um, go, can go through a bust if they're actually using these nests and the numbers will drop very quickly. Um, so not wanting to be outdone, one of the microanthophora actually shows quite a bit of uh, masochism as well in its choice of house. This is a project led by Hilary Ehrenler um, that was published in 2016. This is a place I would really love to go. Um, basically on the edge of this permanently degassing active volcano, there were over 200 bee nests at the last time she was able to check. So basically, to put it another way, this seems to be their optimal habitat right on the edge there. It doesn't seem perhaps like the best option on an evolutionary, in an evolutionary framework. It seems a little bit dangerous. Um, it does not ultimately seem to me like a stable strategy, basically sacrificing your children to the volcano. Um, I mean, there may be certain, certain groups that disagree with me, but in my view, it just seems like generally a bad idea. Now, we don't really know why this is because it's been hard to get back there after this initial sighting and a couple years checking up on them. Um, there was permanent, uh, there were eruptions during the time that Hillary was supposed to go back. Um, to this day, I think maybe she hasn't been able to because then after all of those issues and various political issues getting in the way, then there was also the whole pandemic thing, which has restricted travel a little bit. There are still parasites here notably, so they're not totally escaping them. I think there were uh, four species of mutilids there still somehow. They're very dedicated in finding their hosts, it seems, um, but maybe there are fewer. It's, it's really hard to say. It could also be perhaps some kind of sensory trap because these bees, most of them are better in dry, relatively arid areas. It may be that this is the best approximation of the kind of place they'd actually be nesting in more, um, more xeric areas. Because once you get to this area, it's quite, quite tropical, um, but definitely more data are needed. And I wish they picked a closer volcano because really they've, made it a little bit difficult for me to go down and study them further. Um, so here I've talked a little bit about the background and various cool stories sort of in the group. Um, from here, I'm going to transition into something entirely different. Um, and I'm going to talk more about their systematics and really a little bit of the biogeography of this group from a phylogenetics perspective. So the subfamily Anthophorini, this is about 750 species or so, but there are still many cryptic undescribed species, even in places like North America. Um, I think there's still five or so Anthophoroides that I need to get around to describing at some point. Um, there are seven genera total accepted. Um, in the paper I'm talking to you about, actually, we, um, we synonymize one genus that was recently described. So it's going to be back to seven. Um, two of them are endemic to South and Southeast Asia. And there's 200 plus species specifically in that area. Based on that and based on a morphological phylogeny, Dubitsky 2007 in Systematic Entomology, he suggested that perhaps that is actually the origin of this group because there's also pretty high generic, generic diversity um, so there's things, this is the Elaphropoda, the Habrophorula, the Amagilla, the Anthophora, um, the Habropoda, if I didn't say it. Uh, there's quite a few groups, genera, that are all right there in Southeast Asia. So this is a rather interesting idea because it's in most phylogenetic reconstructions, it's been found to be relatively old. Um, and this has implications perhaps for the origin of the apidae itself. Um, so there's various hypotheses that have been raised. And of course, those would contrast with the general pretty well accepted idea that 
fees overall arose in Gondwana, um, about maybe 120, 125 million years ago. Um, so there have been many different placements. Um, we really, for this study, we focused on five of them. Three of them really are the most relevant ones uh, recently. There, of course, have been a lot of placements um, when morphology was the primary data set used. Um, then back then, people thought they were maybe sister to the Centrodyne, for instance. Um, but that's been pretty well refuted. Um, notably, that is the that is the group that um, Dubitsky used as a sister group. So maybe if those analyses were rerun, something different would come up. If they used the more re recently uh, realized and accepted sister groups, um, so basically. What we have here is anthophorony. It's going to sometimes be sister to the rest. Sometimes it's nomadiony and then anthophoryony. And then sometimes, and this one is very often, this third hypothesis is recovered recently. It's anthophoryony sister to nomadiony and that's sister to the rest of the apidy. So what we did to investigate this, um, we basically took some pretty decent sampling for the family apidy. There was a recent paper by Silas um, in 2019 on the group. So we reused some samples from there, added some of our own, um, especially we wanted to get more megachylid out groups just so we could try and calibrate things there pretty strongly. And our data sources for this, we're using, um, oh, someone's, okay. Um, so, we're using the UCE Hymenoptera set V2, and we're also using low coverage genome sequencing. And I wanna take just a quick moment to talk about low coverage genome sequencing, because I think if people have the funding for it, they should definitely do it. There's some really good reasons for this. Um, so a lot of our collaborators have had success with older specimens. Um, in our lab, we've been generally focusing on more recent material because we have quite a bit actually that we've collected recently. Um, it requires less technical equipment in-house than things like UCEs as well. So this is highly beneficial. Um, basically, you just need to do an extraction and then send it off to a company or you could even have the company do the extraction if you really trust them very well, which I generally don't. <laughs> Um, it's a relatively straightforward pipeline for assembly and then use. Um, there are various scripts involved in this Jang et al. 2019 paper um, that I collaborated on, and that's in Methods in Ecology and Evolution for anyone who's interested in it. You can basically then, once you've assembled this low coverage genome, you can pull out things like USCOs, UCEs, SNPs, basically anything. You can design new markers from it pretty well. Um, it's not as perfect as a genome. The coverage is lower, so it's harder to incorporate um, parts of the genome where there's very high repetition, etc. Things like that can be very problematic unless you have really high coverage in these long reads um, that you get with things like PacBio, etc. Um, cost, though, it can remain a little prohibitive. The last time I checked in China, it was about $90 a sample. It could have gone down a little bit by then. Um, but And also decent computer computing power is needed for quicker assembly. But then the methods, the methods we did um, quite a bit, actually. Um, and really, Brandstetter was just quite impressive in the array of ways in which he figured we could check out this relationship. And you'll see why we were so thorough about this in a second. But um, so we did maximum likelihood and exabase as well. We used a wide variety of matrix completeness. Um, we also did astral methods, including um, what we saw was useful from a recent, um, another Silas paper, on Sudapis, collapsing some of these poorly supported nodes in the gene trees can actually make the, uh, the species trees much better off overall, um, agree much better with what's generally accepted in B phylogenetics in terms of relationships. 
Um, and for both, we were, did all kinds of filtering. This is for saturation, base compositional heterogeneity, um, low information contact content. We also used RY coding um, for various typology tests. We also did outlier removal analyses, SIM tests. Um, quite a bit of partitioning schemes were used. And in general, we were using a GTRG model, although we did use model selection also in a number of them. And so now I'm going to show you the first tree. This is tree one of 58, and you can very clearly see where everything is in the tree, right? So this is the concatenated 10% matrix completeness, uh, maximum likelihood, no partitions used. You can see very clearly there, that that second clade from the top, that is enthophorini. So that is actually sister to the rest of the apidae there. And now I'm going to walk you through the remaining 57. I'm not actually going to do that. That'd probably be a little bit painful, not just for you, but for me as well. Instead, I'm thinking that we should probably summarize things a little bit. So here you can see a summary graphic there are a number of relationships that were never, never recovered in these 58 uh, trees we did. Um, so HO, this is our primary with Anthophorini sister to the rest. That was recovered in 56 of 58 tree searches conducted. Um, two of them, we found Nomadini sister to the rest. And then... Uh, sister and then Anthophorini sister to the rest interiorly. Um, if you wanna get an idea of the supports, this is from the, uh, the best tree that we used. Our selected best tree was with the 75% completeness matrix. It had a pretty decent balance of number of loci versus missing data. Um, so it worked pretty well, I think. You can see here, there are very few things that were under fully supported in exabase the exabase analysis we did everything was a one which was pretty unusual in my experience um usually bayesian values are higher but they usually aren't all one um but you can see anthophorini given here in the little red slice and there it is again uh sister to everything else within the apity um so it's quite well supported overall. And so talking specifically about Anthophorini, I'm not going to belabor the overall um, results because really our focus was on the placement of this subfamily and then the relationships within. But um, so within, everything was pretty much totally consistent in terms of the generic level. Um, even also at the species level, there were very few disagreements, and it was pretty clear in almost all cases, except for one internal node of Micranthophora, where what the correct um, result was. Um, in one of the astral analyses, we actually had Pachymelis um, in with Deltoptila and Habrophorula and Elaphropoda. That was one single one, though, and once we collapsed down to the 50%, um, level, then that disappeared actually. So it was fixed. Um, so you can see here, ultimately we have Pachymelis at the top. This is, as you may recall, from South Africa and Madagascar. It's endemic to this area. Next, we have a clade that is Deltoptila with Habrophorula and Elaphropoda, those latter two sister to each other and Deltoptila sister to it. Um, Deltoptila is interestingly um, just about entirely endemic to Central America, especially montane areas there. So that's a little weird, um, given that it is sister to these groups that are endemic to South and Southeast Asia, inclusive of Southern China. Um, so that's a little bit of a strange thing going on there, especially since the, the um, original group uh, the sister to the rest, Pachymelis, is from South Africa and Madagascar. Um, then we have Habrophorula. This is basically, this group is basically found throughout the Northern Hemisphere. Um, then we have 
Amagila and Anthophora, sister to each other. Amagila is old world only, Anthophora is worldwide, basically. Um, so I just went through a bit of this already, um, but this is very interesting and I want to focus on it a little bit. These very strange relationships that we get here, because um, how did this happen basically? So the question is, how do you have something that's endemic now to Madagascar in South Africa? And I should note that most of the species by far are in Madagascar. Um, there's just one, maybe a couple on the mainland. Um, we need probably more sampling to see if there might be a, some more, but it seems like the vast majority are actually in Madagascar rather than Africa. Um, so it makes it a little strange to think about this um, trajectory going up through Africa, across Europe, into Asia, and then everything that was there died, basically. We don't have record of them there anymore. Um, now, it could be that the, the ancestral distribution was the entire area, that they were exceedingly widespread, and then they just everything died off in between. Um, no matter what narrative you want to pick for this, there's a lot of extinction that's going to be invoked um, to actually get these bees up into South and Southeast Asia and then to have nothing in between from these relevant groups. Um, so actually, one thing I've been thinking about more recently is this kind of out of India hypothesis where actually they could have been on the Indian plate as it traveled northward. Um, now, this is a difficult one to actually support because generally we are we do think that they're a bit younger than they would need to be to have actually been on the plate when it was pretty well connected to Gondwana around 120 or 100 to maybe, depending on who you ask, some say 120 million years ago. Um, I don't think it's possible if it was 120, but if it was 100 when the Indian plate was down closer to um, closer to Gondwana, specifically right next to Madagascar, notably, um, then maybe they actually just rode up there. And that's why we have no record of them, these relevant groups at least, or their ancestors in this intervening area. So this is something we need to look at more from a formal biogeographic uh, perspective. Right now, I'm just kind of hand-waving things um, because we did not do that type of analysis in this first paper. Um, but beyond this very interesting aspect of their biogeography, there's also um, a lot of new world, old world splits in this group. So you can see here, I've indicated with um, green dots where there's a clear split between the old and the new world, where at some point that has had to happen. But then on the right, you can actually see in these little triangles, the green triangles are ones that have representatives from the old and new world. And in some of these cases, it might be that they've actually moved back and forth multiple times within a single group. Um, I wouldn't be too surprised about that for things like, say, uh, Pyganthophora and Lophanthophora, especially because these are very large bees. They're spring bees, many of them, and they're probably very good at dealing with colder environments, like what the Bering Strait would have been, for instance. So overall, there's a lot that I learned from this, from working with Michael Brandstetter on this project. Um, but it seems like still there's ongoing challenges here because while all of our almost all of our tree searches supported this hypothesis, there's still a lot of conflicts that have been acknowledged, um, phylogenetic conflicts in the apidy. Um, there's very short branches at the base, so that's making it pretty tough to get a reliable um, result in some cases, it seems. Um, Collapsing bad nodes, as I noted before, that was really helpful for the astral analyses. So anyone considering do that, doing that, I would, I would definitely agree that that's a useful idea. 
Um, we did see some minor instability in the nomadini, the Eucerini and the Xylocopini. Um, the Xylocopini, that I think that was in the astral analyses again. And then when we collapsed down, we were actually seeing it go back to normal. Um, the nomadini, these were really minor disagreements with each other, um, pretty interior nodes. Um, that was one of the ones that you could see was poorly supported in that tree prior uh, when I showed the big circle tree. So, um, but also we did several different um, analyses looking more to try and figure out these conflicts. Um, things like GGI, gene genome interrogation, um, concordance factors and quartet sampling. Based on all of these, it says it's only weakly supported. Um, for GGI and concordance, it still seemed like ours was the best supported, but weakly so. Quartet sampling, though, it wasn't uh, wasn't fully in agreement. It wasn't very um, wasn't very convincing. But honestly, I think the uh, the quartet sampling method it doesn't make that much sense to me because if you need good taxon sampling to reconstruct the correct relationships then subsampling these quartets, these four quartets from a phylogeny, um, even if you do it a thousand times, you're just emulating a uh, poor taxon sample. So I, I took that um, result kind of with just a little bit of, um, a little bit of caution. Um, but ultimately I think to be certain about this, we need to have one big tree with very dense sampling for all of the aphids. I think maybe something contributing to Anthophorini getting being sister to the rest, if that doesn't end up to be true, it may be that perhaps because we had such dense sampling for the group, um, we had the algorithm essentially, it had a very good idea of exactly what the ancestral state for things was at the base of Anthophorini. Maybe there's more uncertainty on in some of these other groups and as a result, it says, oh, this is definitely what should be at the base because it's confirmed, there's less uncertainty, it's more similar to these outgroups. Um, that's just, again, a bit of hand waving, um, but I think to be sure of this still, because of these results from GGI con for concordance factors and quartet sampling, we really should get a better sampled phylogeny and then redo a lot of these analyses and see what's actually happening here. But no matter what, I think it's going to be a very difficult node to actually figure out. Um, and just a preview of some of the other ongoing projects I'm doing. So in China now, it's actually very easy to get genome sequenced. It's very relatively cheap. Um, and for my work, I've basically been running around collecting uh, samples that are useful for this for several various different projects. But what we've built so far, you can see here in the blue dots, there's actually quite a few um, representatives we have. I, we still need to get Pachymelis and Deltoptila, Lafropoda, these very much rarer, harder to get groups. Um, once we have that, we'll have a very good idea of the genomic landscape of the entire group. But if you see that little red dot, that's actually the, um, the subgenus Malia. And these are well known for their mimics. These are actually Batesian mimics. Um, they do not sting. I've found them and I've pinched them myself. Um, many other people have done the same. And they actually seem to have lost the ability to sting. Um, this specific image, this is from the uh, mountains near Beijing. One single site, one collecting event. These are females of Anthophora plagiata. And you can see there's a huge amount of polymorphism. Um, I'm hoping we can actually use some of this uh, resequencing and these genomes to actually figure out what the basis is. I think maybe it could be, given it's not a simple thing, you can see kind of a gradient here of darkness. Um, I think maybe it's something epigenetic, maybe methylation is at play here. 
There's a lot we have to look into, but basically the first step is going to be finding a very huge nesting aggregation for these species. When I say four here, actually, that's four genomes that we have or have underway for Malia. And I think actually it's probably different mechanisms underlying the uh, different types of color forms we're seeing. So that could be very interesting going forward. Um, we have, um, it's much easier to get these aggregations for the US species um, compared to in China. Um, there's been a lot of land alteration, um, even for the Olympics, actually, one of the, uh, one of the nesting sites was destroyed, unfortunately. But this is an ongoing project and it's pretty exciting for me. So I wanted to talk about it a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I should also acknowledge my collaborators, especially on the phylogenomics work. Um, and then just a whole, a huge list of people who have contributed specimens um, or they've contributed to the projects in some way. Um, and of course, also Chinese Academy of Sciences and the National Science Foundation of China. And that's it. So I'm happy to um, answer any questions you have here, or I'm also available through email at michael period christopher period or at gmail.com. It's the longest email address ever, I know. It's unfortunate, but all the other variants were taken. So happy to chat. And thanks for any questions you might have. So for this, should I, um, should I stop? That's completely up to you, Michael. Okay. Welcome, um, Silas. Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Silas. I'm going to lead the Q&A session. Um, thank you very much, Michael, for a very exciting talk. Uh, certainly learned a lot of new stuff. Um, I'm going to have a quick look here. Um, we have one question so far, and that is from Nora Romero. Um, she's a grad student in Lawrence Packer's lab. What a great talk. I'm just wondering how good, how good is the fossil representation for the Antophorines? Okay, so unfortunately it's rather abysmal. Um, I mean, if bees in general, you don't have too many groups with a lot of good fossils. Um, and Thophorini, it's, um, there's a couple that are close to Habropoda. And then there are some weird older ones that were said kind of hand wavy, like maybe this is Anthophora, I don't know. And those ones I don't think can re really be used. So it definitely using fossils for dating is a challenge and that's part of why we kind of uh, we kind of avoided that in this first paper. I see. Yeah, very much understandable. Another question from Louis Hesler. Nice talk. Could the pogo myrmex be culling diseased or parasitized um, from the sandstone nest sites? I suppose parasitized bees, immatures. Um. So, I mean, that there's the potential that they'd be doing that incidentally. I don't think they would be um, directly going after any specific type of larva. Probably they'd just be getting anything they can get. Um, one interesting note that I didn't mention is that actually the, uh, the females, they're at least the females, possibly also the males, they're overwintering in the nest tunnels. So, if they were out actually during the period of activity of Anthophora peritomi this time, which is was quite numerous at the site, as you could see in the video, um, and actually they I could hear them buzzing, defending the nests. So this actually, the larva that was taken based upon size and also the stage of development, it would have to be Anthophora pueblo actually. So this would be the species that did not have anything defending the nest at that time because the adults would already be dead because they're a spring species, whereas Anthophora is fall. So I think they just go whatever they can get, go for whatever they can get. Um, but I've seen actually very interestingly, 
other ant nests right next to um, Anthophora nests, active ones, both sides, and the nests are not being bothered at all, hmm. which is really something, something interesting might be going on with at least some species. And that was without Anthophora californica, which is also one of these Anthophoroides, the same subgenus as Pueblo. So, well, there's a lot of these kinds of things that I'd love to look into mm -hmm. further. There's only, only, only so many days in the year and only so many of those days in the field, unfortunately. Interesting. So the, the adults, they overwinter in the tunnels. Um, for this group, I do not believe so. When I said, um, I said uh, overnighting, I think. Oh, so they're okay. spending the nights in the tunnels. So I was hearing them buzzing in defense. I see. There are species that do among Anthophora overwinter as adults, mm -hmm. like um, some of the, uh, what's it, the loaf Anthophora, at the very least, some of those are documented to do this, these very early spring bees. But for these, it wouldn't make sense because neither of them are very early in the year. Thanks. Yeah, we have more questions here. Next one is from Patrick Kennedy. Thanks for the lovely talk. My mind was blown by bees on a volcano. Can you say more about how they survive in this presumably extreme, harsh environment? Um, they're tough. I, I don't honestly know. They must be very tough to actually be able to deal with this. Um, Hillary, she saw that actually to forage, there was a um, patch of plants that they were foraging at, an aster, um, like on the other side of the volcanic rim. And she said they just went right through the cloud, like the toxic glass cl gas cloud. They just fly right through it. They don't even care. So <laughs> um, I don't know if this is some kind of local adaptation, perhaps something really weird is going on physiologically, or if somehow they just are predisposed to be able to do this as a species. Um, there, I should note that if you look at their, um, if you look at their distribution, um, they seem to be found closer to volcanoes, the farther South you get in Central America, which is a little surprising, but I mean, maybe these are the best habitats they can get, the most xeric habitats they can get in a tropical area. Um, as they line their nests, of course, so there's some protection for the larvae, but while they're building these um, nests, uh, ash could be falling in. If a larva eats ash, that seems like a really unpleasant meal. Um, just all around it, it seems a very unfortunate place to live for a bee. But like I said, there were maybe like 200 nests and they'd been increasing in numbers up until Hillary was unable to check in on them again. Mm. Yeah, um, we do have more questions. I also have a question, which I, I'm just going to drop now. Um, so when I looked at your tree, it, to me, it seems kind of like Deltoptila is a bit of a biogeographic problem child. I think if that would not be there, you know, you would actually have a pretty clear story from like an old world origin. So how was that, you know, say placement? Was that like really a stable node? Did that ever jump around in various no. analyses or it's always it's the same? True. I think it's true, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would be very convenient if it were just one of these things that's bouncing around in the phylogeny until it finds the right spot and it makes total sense. But mm -hmm. um, from a morphological standpoint as well, it, it just, it also makes sense there, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So that okay. must have been a rather ancient crossing of the Bering Strait or something uh, when it was much nicer. And then everything in between died out when it wasn't tropical anymore. I don't know. Mm. It, it's very hard to explain that. And I don't think there is an easy way because I mean, they didn't swim across the ocean that I think we can all agree on that at least. Yeah. Yeah. That's a hard, it's a tough question, I guess. Um, Sarah Peebles, do we know the composition of the mortar in the ancient Pueblo site? Oh, um, so I, I would probably have to look that up. Um, I imagine it's 
uh, various kinds of clay mixed together. Um, but that is not something I've looked too far into the actual composition of the, um, of the mortar that they're using. Um, uh, one other question from Shilo Judd. Thank you for your work and presentation. I am a medical entomologist who would really like to branch out into systematics and phylogenetics of Hymenoptera. Do you have any resources or books you would recommend? Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, I guess the Michener's Bees of the World is, is the number one go-to for a lot of things. It's, it's a little bit out of date at this point, but still it's got really remarkable information um, that compilation is pretty much one of the best. Um, outside of that, there's a recent um, book by Brian Danforth, uh, very much on the solitary bees. That's, that's more updated. That would be very, very good to have as well. I think the title was The Solitary Bees, maybe? Yeah. So those two, I think, are really, really useful. Um, there have been a lot of very nice... Um, books with like um, nice imaging of actually the bees as well. I think Lawrence might have had one at some point, maybe. Yeah. Actually a, a nice picture book. So that's that's always a winner for like a coffee table book, definitely. <laughs> um, these yeah, beautiful I think it's Lawrence and, Lawrence and Sam Drogi. Yeah, 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 that, that's, but, um, Let's see, a lot of the most recent developments are still in the academic literature. So um, there's a lot of really good work that's being done on bee phylogenetics right now. Um, I'd be remiss to say any, any just one name. Um, Silas, actually, he's been doing some pretty good work, this guy over here. Oh, really? Um, so... Um, there's also Philippe Freitas, there's Michael Brandstetter, of course. Um, Catherine Odenaka recently had a, um, a phylogenomics paper out. Um, it's, it's very hard to list everyone, so I should probably stop before the list gets long and then I miss one person and feel really bad about it later. But I mean, almost all of the recent phylogenomics work I've seen from people on bees has been really nice. So I, I'd say just bee phylogenomics or bee phylogenetics on Google Scholar and you'd find quite a wealth of recent studies that are really nice. Thanks. Do we have a couple more questions? Uh, one here from an anonymous attendee. <clears throat> Hi, thanks for the interesting sharing. Just out of curiosity, did you compare between the trees from concatenation and those generated from Astro? Is there any difference within trees of each approach in between the two? Yeah, so I think the most interesting um, difference was that for Astral, there was that, um, I mentioned an interior node in Micranthophora, and that was actually pretty consistently different between the concatenated and Astral analyses. I know it's it's pretty commonplace that you'll see like something differs between astral versus the concatenation approach. And that was the only one where it was like pretty consistently different actually. And it was a relatively minor relationship. So it, it, it's one subgenus out of all the subgenera of Anthophora that were sampled. But um, that one I found interesting and I'm still kind of thinking about which, which I believe more. So, but in general, they were all showing, all of them were showing the Anthophorini placement um, as presented. Jim Kane has a question. Thought provoking. Oh, except for the two, sorry. Oh. <laughs> One question here from Jim Kane. Um, those color polymorphisms that you have begun exploring remind me of some that we see in Bombus, as Paul Williams mentioned. Might these Antophora be entering into these same mimicry rings, but as Batesian rather than Mullerian mimics? Well, Jim, thank you for saving me because I, I should have been clearer. Yes, these are specifically mimics of Bombus. So definitely there is this kind of relationship. If you look at like Anthophora bomboides, for instance, 
This is the North American species with the largest range um, of the subgenus. Uh, you can actually track, like in the east, it looks kind of like Bombus impatiens, Bombus bimacularis. In the west, it starts looking like things like, say, Huntii. In the coast, it'll look actually like Vosnesenskii more. Um, so really, it's that species at least is geographically tracking very well. And within populations, it's more stable than we see with the, uh, the Anthophora plagiata, where it's totally plastic within the populations I've encountered. This is why I think there might be different genomic architecture underlying these, um, these different uh, mimicry styles. But yeah, definitely it's, uh, it's Bombus that they're, they're actually um, entering these mimicry rings, yeah. So I think also there could be very cool ecological things we could look at, like the, um, the proportion of color, color forms in various um, populations to see if that's changing over years, as you would expect like a, and this is something we can't do with some of the species where it's like geographic separation, but where we have polymorphism, we can actually look if there's like frequency dependence of the color morphs based upon the local Bombus fauna. So that would be incredibly cool to actually look at further, but that requires a big aggregation in an area with a good Bombus population as well. And I still haven't really found that, so. Another question here from Joel Gardner. In your opinion, do you think low coverage whole genome sequencing will eventually replace UCEs in phylogenomics the way the same way that UCEs replaced one to 10 gene Sanger sequencing? Um, short answer, yes, um, eventually. I, I think it's going to happen eventually because this genomic sequencing, um, low coverage genome sequencing in principle is pretty similar to what people are doing to, to genome sequence or to, to like resequence or what have you. Um, the getting the data is similar enough to these various methods and these methods are going to stick around for a while or at least the intention to get a genome is going to stay for a long time so they're going to keep making this cheaper and more efficient and it will benefit i think the um low coverage whole genome sequencing approach very much it'll make things a lot cheaper because it's already cheaper than a genome obviously but it can still get cheaper than it is, I think. Um, I don't think it has reached the, the minimum price just yet. And I think as that happens, it's going to become more and more economic because I think UCEs are probably already close, probably already closing in on their minimum cost. Because at some point you can't make it cheaper just because of the materials involved. Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess one aspect is also that the low coverage whole genomes are pretty nicely combinable with the UCE. So it could also be that it's a bit of a smoother transition. We'll see. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I, I think that's, that's also a great point because really um, they're not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. So you can have like our study, we had um, something like 12 low coverage genomes on our end, and then the UCEs have been generated when I'd gone over to a Brandstetter's lab, actually. Mm -hmm. So we we just put them together, but um, I think going forward, at least from the, um, the specimens I'm using in China, probably I'll keep using the low coverage genome sequencing because mm -hmm. it also, it builds up the ability to pull other markers. If we have other markers down the line, we can't necessarily pull them from UCEs. I, I won't say it's impossible because you can already pull things like Sanger genes from them, but I think the success rate will be higher pulling from the low coverage genome data. I have one other question. Um, so so this, this is another one from me. Um, if you, I mean, what are your thoughts on kind of the, I mean, I know it's sometimes a bit of a 
hard question. But what are the mechanistic reasons behind, you know, the fact that this node involving antophorines and nomadines is so hard? You know, is it is actually are the antophorines the problem or are the nomadines the problem? Oh, because I mean, nomadines I... wouldn't exist. All your topologies would be the same, basically. You know? Yeah, yeah. So so let's just get rid of them, and then it's really simple, right? <laughs> I mean, just just cut them out of the the matrix, and then it's like, oh, everything's consistent. Perfect. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, we we've, we've talked about this before, Silas, and and we've both got some ideas. Like I, one thing you suggested before that uh, I I'd also thought about some is like, as soon as you start kleptoparasitizing these things, maybe there's a big diversification because there's all these things that don't have parasites yet. And there's like, it's just tons and tons of empty niches. Things are suddenly diversifying like crazy. Um, if that happened in a very short time frame, and I mean, that explains these very short branches we're seeing at the base of the APD. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a long time ago and the things that did this originally are dead for a long time. So we're not going to sequence, if we could sequence them like Jurassic Park or something, it'd be perfect. And we'd have an easy answer if we could find the fossils, I guess. But um, it's, it's a tough one. I, I'm not sure who the problem child is. It may be that they're all problem children, honestly. We have one other question, which is a little bit wider in scope, I suppose, from Preeti Chudari. Some bees show mimicries uh, to bumblebees, but in and but actually they are not. Why? So this is something I've thought about. The original reason I came to China was to work specifically on mimics because uh, there's a lot of them here. I found like 15 independent um, lineages going into Bombus mimicry in China alone. So it, it's, and numerous of those are actually anthophrenia. I'm hoping to find a nice way to package this someday, but for now they're too rare to do a lot of distributional analyses, which was the uh, initial, the initial idea with it. But um, so I've thought about this too. Sometimes maybe people are making too big a deal of this and they're not necessarily a mimic. They see, oh, they look the same, so they must be mimicking one another or what have you. Um, I think in some cases, like, um, let's say like all black with a red tail. That's something that I could see arising just as like a um, aposomatic coloration, things like that. That could explain sometimes how similar color patterns emerge that doesn't necessarily mean they aren't mimics. It could be that it started aposomatic and then um, bumblebees move in next door and they've got the same color pattern and they're much more common. You'd naturally then get some benefit from that. So I think it's, it's hard to say though. It's very hard to tell if this kind of mimicry is actually happening to confirm it. Um, 100%, I don't know if it's possible to, con to confirm it 100%, but if you look at things like Anthophora bomboides, and if you look at the color pattern in the range versus the color pattern of the bumblebees, it's a really nice, very nice mix, because you'll see like um, zones where multiple forms pop up in the places where the forms of bumblebees are found in the same place. Like um, the Pacific Northwest, actually, that's where you'll see like both the um, the blacker and then the redder forms of Anthophora bomboides. Nice, thanks. Um, I think we are actually our questions. You made it through. <laughs> um, so unless there are not any other questions, I would like to thank you for your time. Um, I think Carolyn may take over at this point. And uh, yeah, thanks.
Thank you so much for joining us um, across the 32 countries that registered for uh, today's presentation. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time. If you want to find out a little bit more uh, about the rest of this series, please visit www.yorku.ca slash bees slash packer. And that'll let you know um, and give you options to register for uh, some of the upcoming talks. Um, here I've got up on the screen some of our, our next talks that are coming up in the series. Uh, Silas will be joining us again in June, so we're looking forward to having him back again. Um, and next month on uh, May 25th, uh, our very own Katie Dugantis, who's a PhD student, um, is going to be talking about the evolution and adaptive radiation of the Western honeybee, Apis mellifera. So please head over to that website. Again, it's www.yorku.ca slash bees slash packer to register for that uh, particular webinar. Um, and again, you will get a thank you uh, for joining us and just some of those resources. Thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, thanks very much, everyone, for attending. And Silas also for uh, helping with the hosting. And of course, Carolyn and Lawrence for setting it all up.